A U.S. intelligence official tells Reuters Russia is moving nuclear-capable missiles into Kaliningrad, a tiny Russian enclave sitting between Poland and Lithuania. The official says Russia has done this previously for training purposes, but he concedes it could also be a show of strength. President Obama's top diplomat took a break from being diplomatic today and calling for Russia to be investigated for war crimes in Syria. That tough talk, though, did not last. Correspondent Doug McKelway is at the White House tonight with the latest foreign policy flip-flop. It was an unprecedented call by Secretary of State John Kerry. These are acts that beg for an appropriate investigation of war crimes. Kerry claimed that Russian aircraft bombed another hospital in Syria overnight, killing 20 and wounding 100 more. Those who commit these uh, would and should be held accountable for these actions. Then later today, the State Department pulled back on Kerry's call for a war crimes investigation. Not a new idea for him that these are violations of international law, and we have long said uh, that, that uh, that people should be held to account. While the U.S. was sending mixed signals, Russia was matching its air campaign with escalated rhetoric, too. That after the Pentagon yesterday promised to continue its own airstrikes on ISIS targets in Syria. I remind U.S. strategists that air cover for the Russian military bases in Tardis and Mimim include S-400 and S-300 anti-aircraft missile systems, the range of which may come as a surprise to any unidentified flying objects. Russia knows that whatever diplomatic opposition the Obama administration throws in its way is done with the consent of the U.N., but all previous attempts to condemn Syrian President Assad in the U.N. have been blocked by Russia and China. We've been disappointed that they have used that veto to protect Assad. Administration critics say that even a unilateral U.S. threat of a war crime investigation would be seen as toothless by Russia and Syria. The fact is they are taking advantage in a particularly brutal way uh, of America's failure for five years now uh, to respond to the carnage in Syria. Emboldened by what critics call the Obama administration's passivity, some fear Russia is inching uncomfortably close to a shooting war with the U.S. If I were going to move against the United States or one of its close friends and, and allies, uh, I would do it between now and January the 20th without regard to who wins on November the 8th. Welcome back to Justice. I'm Judge Jeanine Pirro. Thanks again for being with us. A lot of breaking news, but a few thoughts with you tonight. My open in the middle of the show. First, he didn't have a strategy on ISIS. Then he wanted Congress to approve a limited airstrike in Syria. Then his strategy was to degrade, dismantle, and destroy ISIS. All the while, he criticized Vladimir Putin, saying he's just a regional power who threatens neighbors not out of strength but out of weakness. I've got news for you, folks. Vladimir Putin is not only a regional power, he is looking to be the world's superpower. And because of his cunning military background and KGB training, he is setting himself up to be just that. And ironically, with Barack Obama as commander-in-chief, the United States is recklessly and pathetically giving up as the world's superpower. This week, as our president addressed the UN, calling Syria's Assad a tyrant and continuing the he-must-go rant, Putin watched like a Cheshire cat, poised to prop up the very man Obama said must go. More weakness. Not unlike the red line he dared Assad to cross. And when Assad crossed it, Obama not only wimped out, but he agreed to let Putin oversee Assad's disposal of those chemical weapons. And when Assad missed the deadline to dispose, nothing happened. Putin is not stupid. He watched the United States get eaten up in the Tehran deal. And then, after meeting with our president, within hours, starts bombing the very people that we are supporting in Syria on the pretext of going after ISIS. And they told us to get out of Syria's airspace. And the worst we could do was to say that Russia was unprofessional. So why should you care?
You need to care because since that JV team ISIS got started, 30,000 have joined its ranks, including 250 from America. They are hell-bent on destroying us and our way of life. And if that isn't close enough for you, pick up a newspaper and start figuring out where the refugees over whom we have no information and no capacity to even vet will be coming to your neighborhood. Folks, there is a new world order that's being created. Iran, Russia, Syria, and Iraq. A Shiite crescent that we are incapable of fighting or understanding. And Putin this week at the UN tells the world that everywhere we've gone and decapitated regimes, Iraq and Yemen and Libya, we've done nothing but create chaos and a vacuum without any ability to maintain stability. Vlad, I hate to even say this. Do we have I the sound? I cannot help asking those who have caused this situation. Do you realize now what you've done? Rather than bringing about reforms and aggressive foreign interference has resulted in a brazen destruction of national institutions and their lifestyle itself. Do you not realize what you have done? Vlad, I hate to say this, but I'm not sure he even has a clue. Some disturbing news from Russia. President Vladimir Putin signed a law outlawing evangelism and cracking down on house churches. The laws forbid evangelism outside of churches and other religious sites. That means people can't even share their faith in their homes or even on the internet. They also restrict missionary work. For example, there can be no preaching, teaching, or any activity aimed at bringing people into a religious group. The Arab-Israeli conflict, of course, is overlaying all this sort of thing. Uh, clearly, Iran is emerging as a nuclear power here shortly, and that's becoming a day-by-day a, a -day source of intelligence information. There were oil discoveries in the Caspian Sea between Russia and Iran, but perhaps even more than that, there are huge trillions of dollars of discoveries uh, just off the shore of Israel today. So it's, it's starting to look uh, as an attractive target. But all these are preparatory steps, perhaps, in advance of what may be ultimately the big show. But there's a question that we need to put right in front of us as we get enthusiastic about Ezekiel 38 and 39. There are good scholars, and I'll use Hal Lindsay as, a, as an exemplar here, that argue that the Ezekiel 38 and 39 is part of the Armageddon scenario as is summarized in Daniel 11. That's their view, and that's fine. There's a group of us that suspect that the Ezekiel 38 may be preceding to the 70th week of Daniel, which is one reason I'm throwing it in here right now. The problem is the missing nations. The Magog invasion deals with peoples that are distant from Israel, a large outer circle of nations. And so, okay, what about the immediate neighbors? And uh, so, where are the Palestinians? Where are the Lebanese? Where are the Syrians? Where is Iraq? And where, is the, where are the Jordanians to the east of Israel? Where are the Egyptians? They're noticeably absent in the Magog invasion. And so, and where are the Saudi Arabians? In Ezekiel 38, they're on the sidelines. Why, why, why aren't they in the picture somehow? Well, as we look at this, we have the nations that are surrounding Israel immediately the subject of another passage. And, uh, and we have the, uh, the uh, uh, displaced Arab refugees, I can call them that, uh, which we call the Palestinians. And so, there's another subtlety I'll put in our thoughts in Ezekiel 37. You may, prior to Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's the famous dry bones vision, where, the, where, where the Israel uh, is regathered as a people. And it says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood up on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Now, in that passage, the word exceedingly is an adverb, not an adjective. It's an exceedingly great mind, which implies it becomes ultimately. It isn't yet. They have a great defensive army, but they're not a conquest kind of army. And yet this implies something else that may be part of the coloration here. 
There are three steps in Ezekiel 37. They're, they were scattered, then they came together with flesh and skin and the idiom of the vision there, and uh, then they came to life and so forth. So the exceedingly great army is an interesting phrase there. The, the, and of course the proud, um, uh, the elite of the services in Israel are the tank corps, by the way. But anyway, let's get, take a look at a psalm that is widely overlooked among students of prophecy. It's coming more in the fore in, in the recent last couple of years, and that's Psalm 83. So I want to pause and take a look at this a little more closely. And I suspect that this is a scenario that's more immediate on our horizon and may be an essential prelude to Ezekiel 38 and 39. So let's take a look at it. And so it's, a, it's, one of the, it's the last of the Asaph Psalms. The psalmist says, Keep not thou silence, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. So it's a call to God for action, if you will. And the psalmist says, For lo, thine enemies make a tumult. They that hate thee have lifted up the head. Wow. And so this is the last of the Asaph Psalms, and it's a puzzling one. It has a number of phrases in it that raise some issues. Whoever these enemies are, the psalmist is calling God's attention to, is they've lifted up their head. What does that mean? Well, let's go on here. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. Now the lingering mystery behind this psalm that haunts me still is who are these hidden ones? The psalmist is calling God's attention to the fact that the people of Israel are in jeopardy, and we'll get to that. But he also alludes this and consulted against thy hidden ones. Who are, at this point, God's hidden ones? Wouldn't be the angels for a lot of reasons. Who would it be? One of my conjectures, the word hidden ones, by me, it means the Hebrew word means the hidden treasured ones. They're, they're, they're a prize, if you will, sort of. And uh, who are the hidden ones? My candidate possibility, maybe there, this is after the rapture, and these are the raptured saints that are absent from the earth at that time. If that's true, it has huge implications for us. But let's just table that for the moment and go on and see what the psalmist says here. They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. In other words, the enemies of God have aligned themselves, as it come, let us cut them off, that is Israel, from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. That's the plea of the enemies of God that's going on, that the psalmist is calling God's attention to this. For they have consulted together with one consent, they are confederate against thee, God. Get the picture here. The enemies of Israel have aligned themselves with one objective, to wipe Israel off the map. Not to take spoil. See, the, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, they, take, they go to take the, the assembly against uh, Israel in Ezekiel 38 is take spoil. Cattle and goods, gold and silver. They're going for spoil. Not here. They're going to wipe them out. You see the difference? Fundamental. The very commitment of Islam is to wipe Israel off the face of the map. That's exactly what the psalmist is calling God's attention to. Are you going to let that happen, is in effect what he's saying to God. And he goes on here. See, the primary basis of the confederation of these enemies of Israel is to wipe them off. Okay. And we know about some people who articulate this rather vehemently in recent years, of course, Ahmadinejad. And, uh, and here are the people that are involved. He lists them in the psalm. The tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarines, Gebal and Ammon and Amalek and the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. And Asher also is joined with them and they have hope the children of Lot. Well, the tabernacles of Edom, who are they? Now, there's a whole other study that I really commend you to get into and that's the, who are the Edomites today? And you'll be in for some huge surprises. And I don't want to use up our time chasing that one. I'm just going to aver for our purposes today that Edom uh, is, of course, among the traditional enemies of Israel. And they are singled out by, uh, by the, the Old Testament for a special judgment and so forth. We'll talk more about them as we go, probably. The tents of Edom, I'm going to suggest, are the Palestinian refugees and the southern Jordanians. 
And let's just leave that without proof at the moment because it gets into some side studies that we'll use up our time on. And, uh, but the tents of Edom, I'll show you pictures of the tents of Edom today. And these are traditional ones. And perhaps the most astonishing one is one of 96,000 people in southern Lebanon, the Palestinian refugee camps. And uh, th they're not limited to Edomites, but the Edomites are among them. And the Edomites are a special mention by Jesus in two of the letters of the seven churches. In Revelation 2.9 and Revelation 3.9, those that say they are Jews and are not, but are in the synagogue of Satan, are objects of Christ's comments, and we'll talk about that as a separate issue. All right, happening now, Iraqis fleeing three towns on the banks of the Euphrates River. There are new concerns that the river's water level is so low that ISIS fighters can just walk across and launch attacks. That's after ISIS militants. They shut off the gates of the Ramadi Dam. This new strategy presenting a major security and humanitarian threat. And the soundboard and all those that are helping us tonight with the camp meeting. Amen. Give them a hand while we get ready to put the title up of tonight's message. Is America setting up Israel for the war of Gog and Magog? Will Israel stand alone in the biggest war in her history? Most of you who have kept up with biblical prophecy are aware that one of the great wars of the Bible is mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, often called the war of Gog and Magog. It is sub-called World War III. Believe it or not, it's the only war that Christians, Muslims, and Jews all have a teaching on. Did you know that? Christians believe it because it's in the prophet Ezekiel's writing, and it's never happened before. Jews believe there's a war of Gog and Magog coming, and most of the Israeli generals who know the Old Testament will tell you they believe it will happen. Believe it or not, Islam has a teaching on Gog and Magog. And they believe that one of the end-time signs of the last days will be a major battle between the East and the West, and it will involve this, this same name, Gog and Magog, we find mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. Now, in that book, without me going into detail and reading it consistently, it tells you the nations that are going to be involved, and it tells you how that there is a chief prince over the North Country. But the point that I want to bring out is not the nations that are involved, which include Persia and Libya and Ethiopia and Tugarma and the North Quarters, Gog and Magog, which is no doubt the southern Russian states that are predominantly Islamic, but it's who's missing from the battle. There's a verse that's puzzled scholars for years, Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 13, that says this. In the middle of this battle, Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all the young lions will say to you, say to Gog, Have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver, gold, to take livestock and goods, and to take a great plunder? It's been pointed out by scholars at the International Prophecy Conference, writers for many years, that they want to know who is Sheba and Dedan, who are number two, the merchants of Tarshish, and number three, who are the young lions thereof. There's been books written about this subject, and I'm going to just give it all to you in one minute. Don't you like that? You don't have to go read a 300-page book. I read it for you. <laughs> That's what I'm called to do. It, it appears that Sheba and Dedan, when you study who they are, are the Arabian Gulf states. Specifically, it would be the oil states. It appears that Tarshish is the area of Britain and Spain, because remember, in the ancient time, in the time of Ezekiel, we didn't have all the national divisions that we have today, so it would be the people of Spain, also the people of Britain and England. Now, England's emblem, as you know, is a lion. Ours is an eagle, but we came out of England and Britain. So it's pointed out that the young lions thereof, young lions. Now, remember, Britain and England existed, but the United States got freedom out of British and English colonies that were here in the United States. 
So scholars say if we were to translate this today, it would mean that the Gulf states of Arabia do not get involved in this conflict. It would mean that we, what we call the extreme western part of Europe would not get involved in this conflict. Let me tell you one reason why Spain would not want to now be involved in this conflict. Because Spain is on the verge of defaulting economically. They do not want to be involved in any kind of a war. Is everybody understanding what I'm telling you now? See, sometimes when you read it at the time, it doesn't make sense, but as time progresses, it does. Now, there again, this is going to be the biggest war in Israel's history based on the nations that are going to be involved in the war. Now, having said that, let me share with you something about the United States. Israel was reformed as a nation in 1948. In the past, Israel ha always had a friend with the U.S. president and with the U.S. administration. In fact, some pictures of the presidents will help illustrate this. Harry Truman was the president who permitted the Jews to have a homeland in Palestine and even signed the paper at the White House that it would be called the Nation of Israel. Nixon sent aid through Henry Kissinger to the Jews during the Yom Kippur War that prevented them from being totally annihilated by the Arab nations. His Kissinger, in fact, stepped off of a plane, I was told, by a news reporter in Jerusalem and said that day, he said, you stupid Jews, don't you know I just saved you, I'm your Messiah. And of course, President Nixon was impeached sometime after that. Now watch this, Carter made peace between the Egyptians and the Israelis after three major wars, the War of 56, 67, and 73. Reagan, as most of you know, was 100% supportive of Israel. He even bombed the house of Gaddafi after the explosion of the aircraft that the Libyans were responsible for. Bush 1, I always call them Bush 1 and Bush 2, Bush 1 defended Israel in the Gulf War with a missile system. In fact, he said, Israel, if you do not get involved, we will ensure that your protection will be uh, guaranteed during this, what we call the Gulf War. Clinton signed the Oslo Accords on the White House lawn with Rabin and Arafat and was also, in his administration, very supportive of Israel. George W. Bush, although he put more pressure on Israel to go to the peace talks and to give up land, behind the scenes he absolutely supported Israel with weapons, with defense systems, with helicopters, and everything they needed to protect themselves from the Gaza Strip, the enemies of the Gaza Strip, and from Hezbollah in Lebanon. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I said Tuesday night, I will be sharing things with you from time to time about this administration. This is not a political message. Clean your ears out and hear me. I'm a prophetic preacher, and I cannot preach prophecy without dealing with nations. Neither can I preach prophecy without dealing with people who control or rule nations. President Barack Hussein Obama has now created the biggest rift in history between Israel and the United States. In a recent survey, when the Israelis were asked, do you believe that the administration in Washington would support Israel in the event of a war? The lowest number of Jews ever to respond said no. Another one said, said the United States would not be there. Let me just give you the statistic. 4% of the Jews, 4% said that the U.S. would support them. The other percent said no. And they now believe, now Rabbi has been to Israel, and I'm not exaggerating, the Jews in Israel now believe for the first time that there is an administration that is pro-Islamic and anti-Jewish. Now, we're going to go plow here a little bit if you don't mind. The animosity between the administration in Washington and the Israelis actually began perhaps under the Clinton administration. There is a story that deals with Clinton and Benjamin Netanyahu. The Oslo agreements had been signed on the White House lawn and there was plans for Middle East peace. The health care reform that the Clintons wanted that was headed up by Hillary miserably failed. Bill Clinton wanted to make a legacy with Middle East peace. Nothing wrong with that. It's a great thing to wish to do. He became very soft on terrorism, especially Islamic terror, because he believed that if he made peace, he could win what's called a Nobel Peace Prize. A Nobel Peace Prize is not only important, 
it's not only world recognized, but you get enormous amounts of money for your speeches once you have a Nobel Peace Prize. So there's benefits more than just recognition. The World Trade Center was attacked in 1993 under Clinton. The bombing of the U.S. coal happened in the 1990s under President Clinton. The bombing of two embassies by Islamic fanatics happened, and they knew it was bin Laden. We had an opportunity to get bin Laden in Somalia, and we turned it down. They wanted to turn him over to the U.S., and the U.S. refused to accept him. Now, here's what began to happen. At the latter part of the 90s, Benjamin Netanyahu was elected as the prime minister of Israel. President Clinton began to put pressure on Netanyahu to stop building in the West Bank, to stop building in Jerusalem. And Netanyahu basically said to him, Jerusalem is not occupied. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. We will continue to build. Bill Clinton did something when he found out that an Israeli election was going to be held. He sent a man by the name of James Carvel to Israel, along with two other men, to ensure that a man named Ehud Barak would be elected in place of Benjamin Netanyahu. And the strategy of the promotion and the advertisements and the criticism toward Netanyahu, it actually worked. Now, there was a reason, more of a reason, why Clinton wanted Netanyahu out than just the idea of peace. And the story was given to me by an insider who said this. Netanyahu was at the White House meeting with President Clinton when a note was handed to him. It would later be discovered that on that note was a name, Monica Lewinsky. A story was going to break. Clinton dismissed himself from Netanyahu and walked out. Benjamin Netanyahu had friends who went to the same synagogue that the Lewinsky's went to. As a matter of fact, several of the women connected to Monica were Jewish women. Now, Bill Clinton's pastor had made a statement that I will abbreviate for you and paraphrase. He said to him when he was governor of Arkansas, Bill, I believe the Lord's dealt with me that one day you're going to be president of the United States. And you're going to be president when Israel needs a friend. But if you turn your back on Israel, God is going to turn his back on you. This was in the heart of him demanding the Jews to give up their land. You didn't hear what I just said. Now, having said this, let me go a step further. Later, Netanyahu came to Washington to meet with President Clinton, and Clinton shunned him, completely shunned him, over the fact that Netanyahu was not doing what the president wanted him to do. So Netanyahu, being in Washington, went and met with a group of co a coalition that was under the direction of Jerry Falwell. It was during the meeting with Falwell in a private room that Netanyahu said, your president is in trouble. There's a Jewish woman that's been having a certain type of sex with him, and we found out about it, and you need to know sooner or later the story is going to break in America. When the story did begin to break, if you'll remember, Hillary Clinton got on Good Morning America, I believe it was, and made the statement that there was a vast right-wing conspiracy against her husband. She never told you who was directing that. But that statement was directed to two individuals. It was directed to Benjamin Netanyahu, and it was directed to Jerry Falwell. At the time when Hillary spoke that, she did not believe that Bill was guilty. She sincerely thought at that time that they were lying on him and someone was making up this story to hurt his administration. I had a friend of mine that told me what Hillary told him when she finally found out the story was true. And I'm not about to tell you from the pulpit. <laughs> but you can imagine. Now let's go, let's go ahead in time and look how things have worked out. Mr. Netanyahu is removed as Prime Minister of Israel. Bill Clinton, his legacy is hindered and harmed as President of the United States because of the scandal with Monica. Time passes. Bill Clinton's wife runs for the Democratic side of the candidate for president, but, a, but another man named Barack, Ehud Barak, Israel, replaces Netanyahu. So another man by the name of Barack replaces her as the leading candidate for the Democratic Party. However, Hillary becomes the head of the State Department. And oddly enough, 
Benjamin Netanyahu becomes the Prime Minister of Israel. How many of you were on my Israel trip when Benjamin Netanyahu came to the hotel and gave a speech at 10 o'clock at night? Would you raise your hands? How many of you remember my opening statement when the Jerusalem cameras were there? I asked them not to air this until we got on our plane and left the country. Do anybody remember my first statement? Can you tell me what I said? I said, I am believing that Benjamin Netanyahu will be the next prime minister of Israel. And about that time, his mouth dropped open. And we interviewed him secretly in a room. No one's ever seen the interview yet because I've never aired it. I just love secret stuff. <laughs> Maybe one day I'll just send it to partners. I asked him some very interesting questions. He is now the prime minister of Israel. Now, let me share something with you. Why is it, and I will deal with this when I deal with Islamic prophecies and the president on Friday night. So I will not get into some things tonight, but why is it that the entire administration that we now see in Washington does not seem to favor Israel the way that past administrations have? Am I the only person observing this? Do you observe that there seems to be a block of some kind between the relationship of... Not, now, not, we're not talking just President Obama. I want you all to remember something. He don't write those speeches. They, every president has speech writers. And he has surrounded himself with a lot of people. So it's not just one man. But it's just like the pastor of a church. When something goes wrong, who gets the blame for it? The pastor does. When something goes wrong in a business, who gets the blame for it? The CEO does. So it may be people speaking into his life. It may be speak of people he surrounded himself with. But the point is this. There is some kind of animosity. So I began to trace back some things that I think you'll find interesting that, in my opinion, may lend to the reason why that he tends to be not so pro-Israel. The first link is a man by the name of Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan is the leader of a, uh, of a black organization called Nation of Islam, and it is headquartered in South Chicago. Now, by the way, when Barack Obama was senator, you have to have the 100% support of Nation of Islam to become any kind of a politician, if it's, if it's local, if it's in the area of Chicago or statewide, in order to be successful. Farrakhan was born Louis Eugene Walcott, May the 11th, 1933, in the Bronx. His father was Jamaican. His father, however, was not in his son's life. Louis Farrakhan joined the nation in 1955, and he became known as Louis X. Now, remember Malcolm X. We don't have all the time to go into this, but the X was very important because of identification and things uh, of that nature in that uh, community. And he rose to prominence, with, prominence within the organization. In October of 1995, it was, as they call him, Minister Louis Farrakhan that organized the One Million Man March in Washington, D.C., the largest gathering that had ever taken place in Washington. Now, in 2005, he was named on certain magazines the Person of the Year. However, may I give you some statements by Louis Farrakhan. Now, please remember, this man is the head of an Islamic organization. This man does not represent the view of 99.9% .9 of the blacks in America. Talk to me, somebody. He does not represent their view. But listen to what Minister Farrakhan said. He says the levees in New Orleans were on purpose flooded to destroy the black community in New Orleans. He said the H1N1 vaccine was developed by men to depopulate the earth, and it was developed to kill a population that can't be fed, i.e., namely those living in Africa. In 1984, in Libya, he said, quote, Israel will never have peace. They have a gutter religion. Jesse Jackson made the mistake of calling New York Jaime Town. Now, how many of you know that's like the N-word to a Jew? You don't say that. That's a, that's a wrong, you never use that word. He got threats by the dozens. Louis Farrakhan got on television and said, if you harm Jesse Jackson, that'll be the last man you'll ever harm. And he was speaking to the Jewish population. He attributed the Holocaust, listen to this, to Jews cooperating with Hitler. He said that white people, this is one of my quotes that kind of jumps out at me here. He said white people were blue-eyed devils. Well, he wasn't talking about me because my eyes is brown. 
and he said they were antichrist. He called Jews bloodsuckers who control the government. Now, you say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Because President Obama's pastor, Reverend Wright, is personal friends and close friends with Louis Farrakhan. Now, you can check this out yourself because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm just throwing this out here for you. Reverend Wright is and was and continues to be anti-Semitic, pro-Palestinian in his writings and in his comments about the Jews. Reverend Wright produced a magazine called Trumpet Magazine, and guess who he featured on the cover? None other than Louis Farrakhan, founder of the Nation of Islam. And he gave him what is called the Trumpeter Award. This is what Wright has said in his sermons. I'm only going to give you three statements. We could give you a whole list. Let me say again. This does not, this does not, boy, I feel this thing in my spirit, what I'm about to tell you. Do not judge Reverend Wright as how all black ministers preach, my friend. Because black ministers I know preach the word and can out-preach most people. Uh, without even trying. I told one guy one time, black pastor friend of mine, I said, y'all can preach without even trying. He said, what are you talking about? I said, you can preach. You don't even try to preach and y'all can preach. I said, you just get me. I said, you, you can preach a story like, Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. I said, you can preach on Mary had a little lamb and get anointed. And he laughed like you did. He said, you're a crazy white boy. I said, I know it. <laughs> but listen to what Reverend Wright said. Quote, the Israelis have illegally occupied the Palestinian territories for over 40 years. Quote, the injustice and racism with which the Palestinians have lived because of Zionism. Here's, a, here's one that's interesting. Quote, when Obama's enemies find out that in 1984 I went to Tripoli to visit Colonel Muammar el Gaddafi with the Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan, a lot of Jewish support will dry up quicker than a snowball in hell. Now that didn't make the news, but that was a statement that he made saying, if the Jewish people really knew who I've been linked with, they're not going to support Barack Obama as President of the United States. Now hold off, what does this mean? No, that's two hot dogs in a stand at a stadium. <laughs> now, if I turn my hand this way, and you're from Britain or England, I have just heavily insulted you because I've given you the middle finger. So if you're preaching over there, you don't do this. I preach that way all the time. But you don't do this over there. If I were to say the word Jesus died on a bloody cross, you all picture the blood of Jesus on a piece of wood. If I go to Britain and England and say he died on a bloody cross, I have just cursed behind the pulpit. Are you all listening to what I'm saying here? I don't want to go into all the cultural differences. But when I was in a communist country and the keyboard player did this, that was a pro-communist symbol, and 10,000 people gasped in the audience because communism had just fallen. When I went to another country and did the OK symbol, the man says, please don't do that here. That's a sign that you want a prostitute to have relations with you. I said, you're kidding me. I said, that means OK in America. When I went to Bulgaria and I said, do you agree with me? They went, and I said, oh, I'm in trouble. They said, no, this is yes, this is no. I said, what? It's backwards. So if I'm preaching and, 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 I, and I'm going to say, I agree with you, I've got to say, I agree with you. If I say, I agree with you, they're saying, why is he disagreeing with us? You've got to know the culture. Now, I want to take you to the Middle East and tell you something about the Middle East that is an absolute fact. In the Arab world, it uh, doesn't matter if it's Arab Christians or if it's Muslims, the greatest insult of a person is to show the bottom of your shoes. When the man threw his shoes at President Bush, that wasn't because he didn't have anything to throw. That was the lowest thing he could have thrown at him. It meant you are trash, you're dung, you're dirt, you're spit. When Saddam's statue fell and they took their shoes and beat him in the head, it was the lowest insult. I have watched people almost get thrown out of hotels in Israel 
by putting their feet up on furniture, just, just like you know, a chair on top of a chair, you will immediately be told to put your feet down. I know people that, not on my trip, that almost got thrown out because the lowest insult is to do that. Now, in the White House, they have photographers that follow the president around and they take pictures continually. No White House picture can be released without the approval of a staff of people who approve the picture. Let me show you a picture of President Obama talking to Benjamin Netanyahu on the telephone. This picture was not only released from the White House, this picture was released in Israel. And the newspaper that was there talked about it was the gravest insult for the President of the United States to be talking to a Middle Eastern leader, especially an Israeli leader, showing the soles of his feet. I don't know any other way than being blunt with you. When the Jews saw this picture, it caused a major uproar among thousands of Jews. Am I telling the truth, Rabbi? When the Arab Muslims saw this picture, because I asked them what they thought, they all laughed and said, oh, we knew what he was saying. The president was saying, screw you, Netanyahu, screw you, up yours. Now, I don't mean to be blunt from the pulpit, but I have no other way of explaining to you how low it is to show your feet. Now, look, President Bush, you can find pictures of him with his feet on the desk, but most of those are taken behind him, never the bottom. I haven't seen one yet in the bottom. There may be, but he doesn't release it to the public when talking in the Middle East. Now you say, well, he didn't know what he was doing. My friend, that brother there on the screen has Muslims in his family, and he knew exactly what he was doing. He was raised in Indonesia. You don't do that in Indonesia. They'll slap you sideways upside your head showing your feet. Now, my point is, that to me is a subtle message. It's just like a symbol that you would do that only a few people, nobody in America would catch that. To me, I'd look at it and say, the man's chilling out, leave him alone. But I know the Middle East too much to know. Now, he also made, our president made speeches in three Islamic nations. He mistreated Netanyahu on the recent trip to the White House. You, you all want to know the inside of that? I'll tell you about it. But the Israeli delegation was called into the White House, and the administration sat down with them and said, it's very important that you do what we tell you to do. In fact, word was sent out. Here's what the word was. We are going to change the world, and don't you step in the way and interfere with it. That was the word given to the Israelis. Well, the, the statement that was made was, you're going to have to do this, this, and this, and this, and you're going to have to do our thing our way, because if you don't, we're going to cut off military and financial aid to Israel. Now, Benjamin Netanyahu told the president a few, a few weeks ago, it's been, he said, let me tell you, Jerusalem is non-negotiable because it is the capital of Israel. Well, that made the president mad. You know what he did? He left the room with the Israelis in there and went and ate in another room and said to Netanyahu, when you come up with something different to tell me, let me know. Then they handed Netanyahu a phone. And they said, if you'd like to call Israel, use the phone. Netanyahu looked at his guys and said, they've got this thing bugged. I'm not going to use their telephone. And he got in the limos, and he rode over to the Israeli embassy, and he told the Israelis what had happened. He said, I'll be coming home shortly because we're not accomplishing anything here. And Israel, he left, and the, the papers in Israel said... It was the biggest shaft ever given to a diplomat from Israel by any administration since Israel had been a nation. I hope somebody's hearing what I'm saying. Now, now, oh, help me, Jesus, to get this across. Now, there's a gentleman who is a friend of mine, and I mean this sincerely, did something he shouldn't do, and he had to go to prison. He's been there a while. He was listening to a teaching I did eight years ago. And he said, Perry, you were preaching on the war of Gog and Magog. He said, do you know what you said about America backing up from Israel about the time that war takes place? I said, no idea. So he sends me the letter and he says, on the tape, here's what you said. You predicted that before this war happens, 
that we will have a president who will not be supportive of Israel or will have a Muslim background or will himself be a Muslim and not want to support the nation of Israel. Now, before we look at this and say, wow, what's going on? Listen to me, because this is important. This is where we have to balance out what the Word says with what we're seeing. I said it Tuesday. I'll say it again. And, you know, I realize some will say amen, and others will say, oh, my, and others will say, great, and others will say, oh, my. It is the will of the Lord for President Obama to be President of the United States. And there's a reason that he is. And I want to share, you, share this with you. This is very important you hear this. He is the first president that does not understand Bible prophecy. Reagan used to call a man I know and ask him, how does this fit in? George W. Bush had Bible studies. I don't want to tell you he even had some Perry Stone material. I'll have to wait till I'm about to write my final memoirs to tell you everything I know that I can't tell you publicly, okay? That'll come one day at the end. When I'm gone, Pam can sell the book and put my kids through school or whatever she needs to do. But I, I want to tell you something that it's important that you understand that him not being aware of the significance prophetically of Israel is significant prophetically. You didn't hear that. Let me say that again. Let me see if I can say it again. The significance of him sitting under a minister that did not respect Israel or the Jews, the significance of him being friends with Farrakhan, and by the way, don't you let him tell you he wasn't. My Lord, they lived in the same neighborhood. Go to Google. You used to be able to look it up. Ayers was over here. His house was there. And Obama's house was there. And Farrakhan's house was there. They all lived in the same neighborhood, folks. They knew each other. Okay? So, so let me just say this. It is, it is significant prophetically that we would have an administration who does not know the prophetic. Why? Because they don't know the proper way to act or react in the event that something happens. But let's go back to the Word. Did not the Word say? Sheba, Dedan, the young lions are going to stand back and say, are you come to take us? Could it be? Could it be that there are so many Islamic nations coming against Israel that the United States, could it be, has administrations, an administration that don't want to get involved in the middle of the mess because of oil? Could it be? I'm only asking, could it be? Could it be that at the time of this battle, the U.S. is having its own crises, and we just can't get involved because we can't afford to get involved with another war involving an Islamic coalition. Oh, ten years ago, we would have looked at this and we'd have said, I can't quite figure that out. How's that going to be? And now with the situations in Europe and the economic turmoil in the EU, we can now see, mmm, I see some scenarios that are breaking out here and that are happening. Sheba Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all the young lions will say, Have you come to take a plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver, gold, to take away livestock, goods with great plunder? Ezekiel 38, 13. Ezekiel 38, 16, and 17. You will come up against my people like a cloud to cover the land. And it will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the mountains may know me when I am hollowed in you, O Gog before their eyes. Basically, God is saying, I'll take charge because I'm going to get glory out of this one. Y'all, you missed a good place to see. Jesus said, Matthew 24 and verse 9, listen to it. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and shall, you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. 1.4 billion Muslims may like Americans, they don't like our government necessarily. But I tell you one thing they don't like. I've not met one yet that really, really loves Jews. Some of them have Jewish friends. Some of them have Jewish friends for the sake of business. But to say they love Israel, can't find Muslims that love Israel. In fact, anywhere you go in an Islamic country, there is an inbred hatred in the mosque for Jews. In Iran, 
A Christian girl contacted me. She got saved watching us on Manifest on the Internet. And she wanted to go to a Christian church. Rabbi, this is so sad. She found a Christian church and wanted to be baptized in water because she knew she needed to be baptized. And when they found out that she watched Manifest and they found out that she loved that teaching on the Jewish people, they said to her, you cannot be a Christian and love Jews. And they said, we are not going to baptize you in water until you deny that the Jews are God's people. And that God has a place for them. She said, I can't deny that based on the truth I've heard. She wrote me and said, what do I do about getting baptized? And Gina emailed her back and said, Get, fill your bathtub up with water. Put your hand over your nose. Say, I baptize me in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And go under in the bathtub. And Jesus, come on now. Now, I want to ask you a question because let's move from just kind of this side of it, more into asking ourselves this question. What will make this war that's coming up, the Ezekiel 38, 39 war, different than any other war? First of all are the coalition of nations. If you look at a map of the coalition of nations, you will have nations that one time were pro-Western that are highlighted here. You will have the northern part of Africa, which would include Ethiopia, which, which, by the way, is also the area of Sudan. Islamic fanatics there that are hijacking all these boats. You've seen them. You will have the, uh, the, the, the northern part of Africa, which includes Libya and Ethiopia. You will have the country of Iran, which is Persia. You will have Gomer and the North Corps, which includes the area of Turkey, and uh, all the way over to the southern Russian states. And you will have uh, uh, Gog and Magog. Now, if you look at a map, Jerusalem, and go directly north of Jerusalem, guess where you come to, folks? You come to Moscow, Russia. And so this is what it's all about. Now, here's the question. Why will, why would these nations that are Islamic nations invade Israel knowing, ooh, this is going to get thick here, knowing that the United States with our military might would normally stand up with heavy weaponry and defend Israel. Why would they do it? Can I give you the reason? I'm going to give you three reasons why they'll do it. Number one, because as they have become rich, they have become less dependent on the West. They don't need Western money anymore. They can get money from other places like China and Russia and Europe and the Euro and the Yen and the British. They don't need the United States anymore the way they used to. Number two, they can now depend upon Russia and China for weapons without limitations. There are some things we don't sell certain countries. You understand that? There's, there's stipulations on certain countries of what they get from us. China and Russia, but especially China, will sell anything to anybody if the price is right. So the Islamic nations are now co uh, coalition with China and Russia when many of them used to be pro-Western and lean toward the British and the English because we were the ones that went in and helped get the oil well started. Uh-huh. The British and the Americans went into Saudi Arabia, dug six wells, found nothing. We're about to pull out and hit the seventh well in Saudi Arabia, and the rest is history. All right. Number three, it has to do with unification. The Islamic world will unify any time it involves Israel, and it involves with either attacking Israel or Israel attacking an Islamic nation. So those three things make this war a little different than wars of the past. Number two, somebody shout technology. technology. Here's what's changing the map of the world. It's called the technology of the nations. Biological technology. Now, folks, this is not a rumor. There are Department of Defense papers that you can look at on the Internet that show you that Syria has an active biological chemical program and that Iran has an active biological and chemical program. One of the greatest fears of the United States, and I've had three sources now absolutely confirm to me that this is not a rumor, it is true, that the Iranians have invented a chemical, it's a, bi it's a, it's a biological weapon actually, that they've been working on for years with Russian scientists that they pay $500 a month. And they wanted to be able to pollute a water supply, but the problem is when you put certain things in a water supply, the water will dilute the level of it, and it can make people sick, but it doesn't necessarily kill them if it's a large water supply. This substance has been perfected. An Israeli who went to a meeting went out to dinner with me and said, Perry, I've got to tell you this. This has blown my mind. 
that there's a bunker in Iran right now where this scientist has invented and, and come up with and completed a biological weapon that if put in a water supply will kill two million people at one time once it gets in their system. A man heard me say that. He's retired from an agency in Washington. He no longer works there. And he said, since you know information now, I will complete the puzzle for you. This scientist has already tested this biological weapon. They put a drop in, a, a, in, a, in donkey's water, and a donkey drank a, a drop of it in water and dropped dead in 30 minutes. They then went up to the border of Iraq and Iran to a Kurdish village in the middle of nowhere that had 400 people, and they put a little bit of it in the water supply, and they took out all 400 people who just simply died of an agent that was in the water. And this, I said to this man, is it true if they release this agent... Can it take out that many people? He said, theoretically, absolutely it can. I said, so you're telling me that Ahmadinejad, when we go to war, is going to try to get that biological weapon in the United States and take out New York or take out Chicago. He said, no. He said, the information we had before I left was he's going to try to take out a city in Russia. Now, wait a minute. The Russians are helping the Iranians build their nuclear program along with the Chinese. Why would they attack a city in Russia? Because if there's a war going on involving Israel and the United States, and all of a sudden hundreds of thousands of Russians are dropping dead, then it's going to be told that Israel Mossad or the United States CIA, in order to keep Russia out of the war, in order to distract Russia from being involved in the war, is killing Russian people. Thus, the Russians will then turn on the Israelis or turn on the Americans and thus help save the Iranians. This thing's getting deep. Number two, nuclear technology, North Korea and also Iran. I'm going to tell you something about that in a minute. And number three is computer technology. Hackers, they believe in Iran, shut down the power grid in California a while back. These hackers are now being able to hack into grids and hack into ships and different things and being able to shut systems down. So computer hacking... And if you've ever saw the special, in fact, it was one of the things CNN did that was good. <laughs> they did a special a while back on this whole computer system. What would happen if somebody attacked the power grid and from the power grid to this? And it is actually within the next few years a possibility that someone could hack the power grid in the United States and shut the entire power down on the east coast of the United States. It is not impossible for that to happen. So these things have changed the war. Several years ago, I want to talk about the Golan Heights because this is an area where in the future, Ezekiel 38 and 39 mentions the Bashan. The Bashan is the Golan Heights. And it's north of, if, how many of you been to Israel with me? You already know what I'm talking about. You've got it in your mind. Where the Sea of Galilee is, the, it, the, the Bashan or the Golan Heights is exactly north. Now, all of that territory that is uh, to the right of the line used to be Syria. And Syria wants it back. And they told Israel, oh, we're going to make peace with you if you're willing to give up the Golan Heights. The problem is Israel now has built, and it's not a problem for Israel, it's a problem for Syria, has now built enormous numbers of underground military bases and listening devices and places to listen in all over the mountains there. There's a place called Kissinger Hill that has a lot of equipment in it, and I won't go into detail about that, but because of that, Israel cannot afford to give up the area of the Golan Heights. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when you begin to read Ezekiel 38 and 39, there is coming a war, and the Bashan area is one of those areas mentioned in the prophecy where great numbers of soldiers are going to fall in the time of the battle. And it's a large area, by the way. It's much bigger than you've seen on the tour. The past two years, how many of you went with me to Nimrod's castle this year? Is that not the coolest place in all of Israel? I'm telling you the truth. And did you know the, did you know the Golan Heights was that big? Did you know I didn't know it was that big because I'd never been up there before. The Golan Heights is massive. And it's going to be covered one day with tanks and soldiers and, and foot soldiers and things of this nature. But I was eating lunch with a retired colonel one time, and he's a friend of mine. And we were just talking about things. And I brought up Ezekiel 38 and 39. And I said, do you realize that in the weaponry used, like the hailstones falling from the sky and fire and all these other things, I said, do you realize that can all be modern weapons? And the colonel looked at me, and i never forget what he says. He says, well, I'm of the opinion that it's all supernatural. And I said, what do you mean? He said, God says he's the one that does
does it. So he will use natural things in the realm of the supernatural to happen. It does not have to be major weapons. So what I decided to do in this message was to research the natural side of the war of Gog and Magog. In Ezekiel 38 and verse 20, it says the fish are going to be affected. Now I can tell you where that is. That's the Sea of Galilee, and also there are fish in the Mediterranean. The Sea of Galilee is the largest lake with fish in that area, and according to the Bible, the fish are going to be affected and shaken at the time of the battle. In verse 20 of Ezekiel 38, it mentions the birds of heaven. How? That the birds of heaven are going to be affected. Now listen carefully. Did you know that the migration of birds in Israel happens during the time of the spring feast and the fall feast? Did you know that in the spring and the fall there's up to 10 million birds that are up in the Golan Heights area? The Israeli fighter pilots, am I right, Rabbi, have got to be careful during bird migration uh, season because you can take a large bird. Now uh, these engines, these military engines will chop that bird up and spit it out on the other side. But but you can have a large bird if you go at high speed to crack your windshield if you're not careful. It happens on large planes, and there are certain types of air, aircraft that if it's not protected properly, those birds could damage it. So in other words, it could be an indication with the birds being affected that it's going to happen during an either the spring feast or the fall feast when this particular battle is going to break out. It says every creeping thing on the ground feels the effect of the war. In the Hebrew, it's the word for reptile. It means how many how many of you have been to Israel? You've seen the conies. Come on, conies. They, they, they look like little groundhogs almost. They're, they're real cute. Just get near one and watch him bite your finger off. But they're real cute and they're all over the rocks. And you've got all these little animals that are all up into the mountains of the Golden Heights. Then listen to this. It predicted that the walls would fall. Oh, we got a contradiction in the Bible. Because in the book of Ezekiel it says, when, the land, when you come to the land of unwalled villages, in the time when Israel dwells safely, the battle will take place. Then it turns right around and tells you the walls are going to fall in the battle. Now, is that a contradiction? No, because homes have walls. There are villages in Israel that have a protective wall all the way around that village, especially in the West Bank, the Golan Heights, and the Gaza Strip, to keep terrorists from getting inside of the homes and attacking the people. And by the way, woo hey, this wasn't going on eight years ago. The biggest wall now is a big, huge concrete wall that goes all the way around the West bank and if the Bible talks about walls falling you'll see that wall collapse in the time of this battle is anybody understanding the word of the Lord tonight Ezekiel chapter 38 here's what he says there will be great flooding rain that will suddenly come when Gog and Magog comes down to war this is interesting if you've ever been to Israel when you are at the Sea of Galilee it'll be a certain temperature but when you get on that bus come on and you go all how many of you want to go there and you go all the way up to that that mountain to Nimrod's castle, that temperature can change from 10 to 20 degrees depending on the time of day. Number two, the Sea of Galilee is lower because the Dead Sea is, you know, lower. And so when, when clouds are coming in, by the time it hits the temperature level of Galilee, the clouds will disperse. You don't always get the rain. You'll get fall rain certain times of the year, yes. But the Bashan area gets rain quite extensively. When it's not raining in the Galilee, it'll rain in the Bashan. Why am I telling you that? That's the Golden Heights. That's the same area Ezekiel said where the battles will take place. So it rains in that area. Number two, the Bible says in Ezekiel 38, there'll be great hailstones that will fall from the sky when the battle occurs. Well, does that happen there? Yeah. November 1991, I was at the hotel at... Um, I believe back then it was the high Regency, and I went to Robert. I said, Robert, where do you got planned to go tomorrow? He said, we're going into uh, the area of, Ty of, of um, uh, Tel Aviv. We're going to go up to Joppa. We're going to go to Haifa. I said, no, we're not. He said, what do you mean? I said, you're going to cancel it tonight. He said, I can't. We're having lunch there. I said, the Holy Ghost told me that we're not supposed to go to Haifa, and we are going to the Dead Sea. So you can go to Haifa tomorrow, buddy, but I'm not going to be on the bus with you. And he said, what do you feel? Do you feel something bad? I said, I'm very troubled about Haifa. I can't tell you why, but we're not supposed to go because the Holy Ghost said so. He said, oh, brother, you're creating a problem for me. I said, tell him we'll eat later. 
later. And so he canceled the lunch. The guys were totally upset, but there was enough tour groups there that they could save the food for another group. Guess what happened? We went to the Dead Sea. Glad we did. Do you know what happened in Haifa the very minute that we would have been walking out of our buses? A hail storm hit with hail the size of softballs. It knocked out the windows of homes. It knocked out the windows of tour buses. It hit people in the head, put concussions on top of them, and people that lived there said in 60 to 70 years they'd never seen hail that size, and they'd never seen anything like it. And aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit knows where you're supposed to go when you're in the Holy Land? Hey! you got to learn to listen to him. So it does hail, large hail at that time. Why is that important to understand? Because hail large enough can kill somebody if they're out in the middle of it. Number two, I have a King Air F-90. You do not fly. Now, you can fly in rain. You can fly in wind and rain. You can fly in wind and rain with lightning an uh, hour away. But you cannot fly in ice. You don't want ice and you don't want hail. It will not only damage it, it can knock your windshield out. It can bring your plane down. Ice will build up on the, on, on the, the, the rudders and on, the, on uh, uh, the landing gear and all kinds of other things and you'll have problems. So it does have hail in that area. Now here's another one. There will be fire. I said to the colonel, I said, don't you think that could be weaponry? He said it could be. But he said, think about this. Now listen, the upper Bashan area, there's one thing about it, and it is all over the place. If you'll look at that area, it's got black basalt stones. Do you know where basalt stone come from? It comes from volcanoes. They told me on this last trip, they showed me a mountain. You said, they, they said, you see that mountain over there? That's an extinct volcano. I said, you're putting me on. The guy said, no. That thing is what, that's what formed, I feel the anointing right here. That's what formed this entire area centuries ago at creation, was that volcano right there, and it's extinct. Now, how do we know that one of the ways God's going to take out Gog and Magog hey, hey, is a sudden eruption to where the ash comes down, the sun becomes darkened. Come on, somebody help me preach here. You say, well, where, do you think that's in the Bible? Well, listen to the next verse. There shall be brimstone. Oh, there we go. Brimstone is a sulfur that comes from underground. If you've ever been to the desert, Dead Sea, you can smell sulfur. It's all over the place, especially in the southern part of the sea. And that's because there's subterranean fires burning underneath the Dead Sea. You've heard me teach on that through Journey Through the Underworld. Now, what I'm trying to say to you is simply this. If I will go to Ezekiel 38 and 39, and I will carefully read it, everything the prophet says there can be, yes, interpreted as major type of weapons. And we know there's going to be weapons used. You know how I know those weapons going to be used? Because it says this. Is they don't go up there to bury a corpse except seven months passes by. Do you know why you wait seven months before you touch a carcass? Because there's, there's chemicals or biological weapons or something that's been used up there that it's totally polluted. And you, sh you can't go up there. And they finally hire people out, read your Bible, and I, I believe they're going to have these outfits on when they do. And they take a stick, and everywhere they find a bone, they put a stick up. And it says it takes them seven years to get rid of the weaponry in that area. Anyone that's ever been in the military, can tell you that is a great description of either some type of a chemical weapon being used, maybe not biological, but some kind of a chemical weapon being used. And also it's an indication if it's seven years in getting rid of the weapons, that area, that whole mountainside up there is going to be polluted. So it can be, but at the same time, God is going to send some kind of judgments. Now listen to Ezekiel 39 and 9. I will give you the birds of prey to the, to the beasts of the field. You'll fall upon the mountains of Israel, 39 and 3. You shall fall upon the open field, 39 and 5. Now, it also mentions about the birds of prey. I remember years ago when I went up there and I saw this, and I came back and talked about it. People said it wasn't true, that there were no birds in the Golan Heights. Now, you guys have been up there with us before, but there's all kinds of birds of prey up in the Golan Heights area now. In fact, Gideon told me in 1967, how many of you have been over there and seen the birds? In 1967, there was just one or two birds on this hill, and now they've got 400 flesh-eating griffin vultures just in one area. And you go all over the northern Bashan, the Golan Heights, and these 
huge ravines at certain times of the day, and there'll be all kinds of flesh-eating birds. God said there'd be flesh-eating birds in the area where the battle was going to take place. But here's oh, what I've got to tell you. This is why Israel is going to stand alone. Israel's going to stand alone because Ezekiel 38 and 23 says, Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they will know that I am God. It's very possible. I'm not saying that President Obama will be the president when this war happens. It could be somebody else. But I'm going to tell you something. God's not going to let us get heavily involved like we normally would. Maybe it's because it's going to happen so sudden. I don't know. But there is a reason for it. Because if a U.S. president stood up there and got involved, he would get the credit for delivering Israel. Because if a British prime minister got involved, he would get the credit for delivering Israel. So God said, I'm going to let the world hate my people so bad that they're going to have to lean on me. And when that battle is over, people are going to shake their head and say, how did a state the size of New Jersey, surrounded by all these Islamic nations who hate them, how did they come out of this war without the whole nation being disrupted? Woo! And God's going to say, that's when I'm going to get the credit and the glory from my people. See, now let me talk to you as a prophetic minister. That's why when I see our president doing what he does, I don't get as upset as some of you do. You say, well, it's going to curse our nation. Yeah, but you know what? Might be the best thing that happened. Maybe these dead Christians will start praying like they should. Maybe if we keep having a few more problems, people will go back to church like they should. I'm going to go ahead and preach it. Might be the best thing that ever happened for trouble to break out. I'm telling you the truth, folks. But the reason I don't get so shook up like some people just get all been out of shape is because I know by the book that Israel's going to have to stand by their self, and that's what the prophetic word says. Are you all listening to this tonight? Does it make it right? No. Do I want it that way? No. Does God still have people that know how to pray? Yeah. You know what's going to save us? Because we have a group of people in the United States, a remnant that knows how to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we have a remnant of people in the United States that know how to call on the name of the Lord on behalf of Israel. And as long as God has a remnant, God, the Bible said if we didn't have a remnant, we would be like Sodom and we would be like Gomorrah. God would have already wiped the place out. You know it's true if God didn't have a remnant in the earth. But there is a remnant of people who are praying and seeking the face of the Lord. Listen to Ezekiel. I love this verse. Chapter 39, 6 and 7. Then they shall know that I am the Lord, so I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. And I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. <laughs> Chapter 39, 21 through 23, I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment, which I have executed, and my hand, which I have laid on them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord God from that day forward. See, they have to stand alone so that God alone gets glory alone. Are you listening? Three reasons Israel's going to win this war. Number one, God's word has already predicted it. And if God, somebody said, if God said it, I believe it, that settles it. No, friend, if God said it, that settles it whether you believe it or not. Your belief ain't got nothing to do with when God said it. It's, it's, it, it. Number two, ready? Israel has advanced technology that their enemies don't have. Y'all may be aware that under President Bush... It's now come out, the Japanese released this information that President Bush gave the Israelis permission to do something. He gave them permission to secretly go into Syria and to bomb what was going to be a Syrian nuclear reactor. The odd thing about it was that the Israeli fighter pilots went in there, bombed the place, and got out before the Syrians knew what happened. In fact, the president of Syria didn't know for a while that what had happened. And finally, he was informed. And everybody was so puzzled, they said, how in the world could Israel go underneath the radar of Syria? They didn't. <laughs> Let me tell you what they did. Now, if I know this, it's out there. You didn't get that. <laughs> Somebody said, where do you get your information? Well, nobody tells me anything I'm not supposed to know. The Israelis hacked into the Syrian military computers and shut down their fans. All their computers overheated. And when the computers overheated and shut down, they went in with their military and bombed the place and got out before they could get their computers fixed. You didn't hear what I just said. <laughs> Israel's got some technology that they've not used yet. 
year, several years back, this has been years ago, there was a group of terrorists that were going down a road, and there was a group of soldiers up on the hill, and they had their computer out, and they said, all right, they blocked off the road miles and miles that way, they blocked off the road that way, and these terrorists thought they had the road to themselves, and the Israelis had already blocked the whole thing off. They said, okay, hit them. They sent a missile. They waited hours and hours up on the hill. Nobody understood why are we waiting, but the guys that shot the missile did. When they got down there, you know what they discovered? The vehicles were still intact, and everybody on the buses and in the cars was a skeleton. It's called a neutron bomb. That's the name of it. Melts the skin off the flesh, but leaves other things intact. Israel's got that bomb. That's not a... Huh. They've never used it yet. They could if they need to. Israel has EMPs. They can knock out the electricity and put, put people in the dark for 100 years. That's not something they would choose to do. It's not something they would want to do. They have restrained themselves many times far beyond you can imagine for because they don't want innocent lives taken. Look at what they've had to deal with with their in people dying that were innocent. Number three, Israel's going to win <laughs> because they have a guardian angel. Michael, I got a feeling, I feel like preaching, I wish I had a ham and organ here. Mm -hmm. I've got a feeling I've bumped into him a few times over there. You think I'm joking? Walking one day and my hair stood up, the back of my neck, the side, the arms, the, 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 everything on me. The hair on the chest was even saluting. I said, dear Lord, who am I bumping into? Where are you at? I felt God in the place. Now, let's do, it. let's do about an eight-minute study. Everybody say Persia. Persia. One of the first nations mentioned in the book of Ezekiel are the Persians. The Persians are the Iranians. The leader of Iran now is Ahmadinejad. You keep see, hearing about him. You keep seeing his picture on the news. And he is the man that's defying the West by building nuclear reactors and also taking centrifuges and, you know, taking plutonium and uranium, and he has already admitted, I will have a nuclear bomb. He says it in private. People that know him know it's coming. He has said it's the requirement of Islam to come up with nuclear weapons to balance out the West. This is the most dangerous man right now on the face of the earth. There is no one more dangerous because he is just like Hitler. Now, here's what's sad. Just like when Hitler came to power, and he wrote Mein Kampf, Mein Struggle, and he put anti-Semitic statements about the Jews and blamed them for the world's ills, and he began to preach it in Germany, and no one paid attention. Same thing is happening today. A man like Hitler is threatening to annihilate Israel and the United States, and we're looking at him like he doesn't know what he's doing, and he's just an ignoramus, and just let him rant and rave. My friend, that's what they thought about Hitler. All but one man. Winston Churchill and Churchill said we're in trouble when he heard Hitler make his first speech and England and Britain mocked him. My boy texted me the other day he said guess who was on the cover of Time magazine as man of the year in 19 I think it was 38 I said who he said Adolf Hitler. Ooh, I guess he's right. Now listen carefully if you will go to the book of Ezekiel here's what you will read about this battle I will turn you back, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you down. Do you know what that implies? And I've discussed this with prophecy ministers like Joe Vancouver and Bill Cloud. When you read this in Hebrew, Rabbi, look at it. It's like saying, we've had a war. I suckered you into this war, but you backed out then, and then I turned around and drew you back into the land. You know what that means? There will be two wars with Iran. There will be a war before Gog and Magog. Then they will regroup and they will fight. And the motivation for Gog and Magog will be the Shia Muslims retaliating against Israel for the attack that Israel is going to do against the Persians. Does that make sense to you? We always think there's just one big war coming. Oh, no. Damascus has to be destroyed in, Deuter in, in Isaiah 17 and 1. That hasn't happened yet. I will tell you this. 
that one of the Israeli military men, one of the Syrians, spouted off the other day, uh, this is a few months ago, to the Israelis and spouted off about the weapons they could get and the biological and chemical stuff. And one of the Israeli military men just sent him a message and said, you keep talking like that and you'll find yourself glowing in the dark the next hundred years. Because Syria has 10,000 terrorists, fanatical terrorists, and I don't want to go read my book, Nightmare Along Pennsylvania Avenue. I go into detail about the weapons of mass destruction. Rabbi, does Israel not absolutely know that there were weapons that were moved out of Syria into caves and underground military bases and in the Becca Valley they're buried? Am I telling the truth? Is that the truth? Raise your hand. And George Bush knew it too. And they tried to make a fool out of him, and he was told just to shut it because there was too many countries and too many um, um, companies involved with this, and it would cause, him, cause great, great problems for the entire world. Remember me standing here at this partners' conference and saying, if Jesus tarries, give George W. 10 years and he'll be a hero. Yeah. It's going to take that long. It'll come out. It'll come out. Y'all you know, look at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. I just wish I could tell you what I knew, but I'd get in trouble then. And I'm not going to do it. Will it come out, Rabbi? And he knows it's going to come out. He said one of these days, this is what he told a friend of mine. He said, one of these days, they're going to look back on me and call me King George. <laughs> because they're going to find out I wasn't as crazy as they thought I was. That's all I'm going to say. It, appear, it appears in the book of Ezekiel there's two wars. In 1956, there was a war involving Egypt against Israel. Persia was not involved. In 67, the Persians were not involved. In the 73 war, the Persians were not involved. In the 81 war, the Persians were not involved. In the 2007 war in Lebanon, the Persians provided the missiles that Hamas and Hezbollah used. Am I right, Rabbi? Now Persia is suddenly getting involved with weapons, biological, chemical, missiles, the Shahab missile, nuclear program. They are now the big dog on the block. Israel's greatest threat is that man on the right you're looking at on this poster, Ahmadinejad, who's an apocalyptic Muslim who says he has to start a war because the Mahdi came to him in a dream and said, get rid of Israel and get rid of America, that's when I will appear and lead the world. And that's why he wants a war. He said, I don't care if I lose three-fourths of my country and my people. I am supposed to start this thing on behalf of Al-Mahdi, the awaited one. Now, I hate to say this, but if the administration thinks you can negotiate with a man who thinks like that, you better get your military planes and your ships ready because negotiations do not work with a man who thinks that way. It doesn't work. Preach on, Brother Stone. I'm going to. He has met with Hamas Hezbollah. He has the Shia Muslims predominantly behind him. He's already went to Lebanon to have a meeting, went to Syria to have a meeting. He says, if I go to war with the U.S. and Israel, I want you involved with me in the war. He's already met with Afghanistan. In fact, when Karzai a few weeks ago talked about, I'm going to join the Taliban, you know why he did that? Because Ahmadinejad paid him a visit and more or less told him, if we go to war, I want the Afghanis to stand with Iran. We are at your border. We're brothers. woo -hoo! Jesus, help me right now get this across to you. You know why Israel blew up that plant in Syria? Do you know why they bombed that plant that was being made, the power plant? Because there were 45 tons of yellow cake coming from North Korea that was coming through Turkey into Syria for that power plant. Yellow cake, if done properly, can become a nuclear weapon that can be used. It can become weaponized for a nuclear weapon if you properly know what you're doing. When Israel bombed that, guess where the 45 tons of yellow cake ended up two years ago? In Iran. Iran has had it for over two years now, not counting their centrifuges not counting all their equipment that they've got from North Korea. They bring it in through Syria, into the mountains. They don't have to bring it in through ships. The U.S. Uh, protects the sea lanes. They watch the sea lanes too carefully. But those borders are so porous, those underground tunnels, you can bring all sorts of things in. Can I go ahead and preach a minute if you don't mind? 
It was said that under President Bush, the Israelis said, Do you, can we attack this man? Can we get rid of these reactors at least? He said, I don't want a war in another Islamic country. That's what was, was reported. It was then reported that after Obama became president in the spring, they said, we have to deal with the Iranians. And a man that I'll not name said to the Israelis, no, it's not going to happen. We're not going to give you the codes for the missiles we sold you. We're not going to give you those codes to, to, to release those things. We don't want a war. Let's try peaceful negotiations. Okay? That's like saying, let's make a peace treaty with Goliath. <laughs> David didn't make a peace treaty with Goliath. He said, put your head over here. I'm about to cut it off in Jesus' name. You uncircumcised Philistine tormenting God's people. Took a slingshot after him, right? But there's three reasons why we have not dealt with Iran. Number one, oil prices. If the Strait of Hormuz is shut off, oil will go to $250 a barrel. Number two, the U.S. troops in Iran, I'm sorry, in Iraq, are in danger of missiles. Their bases cannot be protected because a lot of them are not underground. They're tents, they're in the surface, they're in metal buildings. It could be the death of literally 25, 50, or 100,000 U.S. troops if Ahmadinejad is telling the truth and he could release 10,000 missiles at one time. And he would do it. Number three, we haven't done anything because of Russia and China. But I want to say something to you. Oh, my. I believe with all of my heart that we're going to come to a point of a crossroads in which this next war, which will be an attack on the nuclear facilities and bunkers and underground facilities where things are being made, will happen in the country of Iran. And I believe Israel will have to be the one to do it. And when this is over, Israel will get the blame for an economic mess. Now listen, because it will cause a worldwide mess for a period of time. And that's when, my friend, everybody will turn against the Jews. This war. Because they'll say, why did you do it? Look at the mess you caused. Look at the oil prices. Look at the chaos. And they will hate the Jew. But God says, now, let Persia rebuild. And the reason Persia is important, let me see if I can get this in real quick. The reason that Persia is important is because it mentions their burning weapons for seven years. And there are scholars, and I put myself in a category of believing like many of these men, that the seven-year tribulation is a treaty which is signed with many for seven years in Daniel 9:27, And it just might be the after the war of Gog and Magog where the seven-year treaty with the Antichrist is signed. That's why this war with Persia is more prophetic, listen to me, than any war since the 67, six-day war that united the city of Jerusalem. Somebody give the Lord a praise. They'll keep the CD running, if you will, would you? Somebody give the Lord a praise. Come on, let him know it. Whew. For just a moment, I felt led in my spirit to, to do this because I'm learning... I'm having the Spirit of God teach me, son, if I show you something, I, I, I show it to you to tell it to the right people at the right time so that when it happens, it builds people's faith to know that I am God. How many remember when I told you, now th th this is going to have to be partners 20 years ago or longer, 15 years ago and longer. How many remember me at the Grand Hotel telling you I would have a little girl named Amanda and she'd have straight hair? Raise your hand. Do you know why I said that? Because I dreamed it. And I dreamed she told me. To 12 years later, I had that little girl. How many remember when God told me the name Manifest and said I'd have a TV program? Told me in 1988. 12 years later, Manifest came. How many remember, I love telling that story about waking up and God saying, it's my will, the governor of Texas is the next president, and I didn't know who the governor was. How many remember that story? How many were in Israel when we met President Bush, uh, Governor Bush? Y'all were there. Remember, remember the whole incident? How many of you know God told me how the election would go, will of God versus will of the people? I got that on tape. I, one of these days I'm going to release that tape. It's the whole tape of four days before the election where I preached, and I told 400 Floridians what the Lord had told me. Florida before the election. Woo <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I'll just have a good time. All right? Woo. 
How many remember the vision of the two towers and the five tornadoes in 1996 that drove me nuts trying to figure out what it was? How many of you know when the towers fell and that black smoke came? Uh, Dorothy? You, Dorothy, in fact, we did a program at Dorothy's, what, hours, several hours after that happened. It was Atlanta. You were in Atlanta. That's right. You, she brought me to Atlanta. Was it five or six hours we went that night? And Dorothy had the pictures. The pictures were drawn years before this happened. I think a year, two years almost. Now, the other, when was it? I think, um, I'll have to go back. I've got all this in the diary. I, I write down things that we see. You should always do that. You should write it down so you'll have it. How many remember, I told you that I was in uh, Louisiana, and I didn't tell the city for the longest time. i tell you why I didn't, because the Lord restrained me, because I would have had hundreds of calls from Louisiana and Baton Rouge. I've got a huge television audience there, and my poor secretaries would have been inundated, and everybody would have wanted to know, what did he see, what did he see, what did he see, and God just said to me, don't talk about this yet, but I about a year and a half ago, I did a special, and I mentioned the state of Louisiana standing at the coastline, and everybody in the dream was from Louisiana. In fact, Pastor Dino Russo called me from Dallas, Texas today, and I didn't get to talk to him, and he was meeting with seven pastors in Dallas, and they said, we want to get Perry on the line about this tornado vision. I told Dino a year and a half ago what was going to happen. And one of the tornadoes, if you'll remember, I'm standing at the Gulf of Mexico. I told you it's in that direction from... And one of the tornadoes, if you'll remember, I'm standing at the Gulf of Mexico. I told you it's in that direction from the, from the inlet of where I'm standing. And I see a black oil tornado, black oil. Black oil means it's not refined yet. And that oil is spinning, and it's just spinning, spinning. I didn't think about it later. As it's spinning, it's dropping oil all over the place. I didn't think about that until I realized later it's spinning. It hit an oil rig in the Gulf. When it hit the oil rig, I saw that thing go click, and it turned and became a capped well. There was no oil going to come out of there eventually. It was going to be shut off. And I thought, why would the United States shut off their oil? Now, my second interpretation to that has to do with the war in Iran. But I do believe now with that black oil coming all over the coastal area, most of my people and partners who heard that way back that live there are saying it's they, they're telling me it's all over Baton Rouge it's I'm going I'm going June the 30th to preach at Dino's church in Baton Rouge but it's all over the place how many of you know people think you're nuts until it happens I'm really serious and then they say oh yeah I remember that now I remember that now now I'm gonna give you the next one by the Spirit of God I, and I'm, 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 I'm getting a little bit more bolder to do this because I see how the Lord works now you understand you don't ever step out and want to speculate in your flesh. When my son, in this night vision, that if I close my eyes, I can see it as clear as looking at you. When he says to me, Dad, run out here and look at what is happening. And I go outside and I look over to my left. And I see a tornado. And then I can see the roof of the house here. And I see another one over there. And I can't tell you if there were not more behind me that way. But I did see two. It didn't dawn on me till I came out of the vision. It was not a normal tornado. It was in the shape of a cooling tower of a nuclear power plant. Dorothy, did I not go, come here, I, I, I don't have to do this. These are partners. But when, when did I go on your network and share this? Because that, that, you remember that. Three, three years ago, four years ago? It was, the, it was what I'm sharing. Yeah, you were sitting there and said, oh my goodness, I'm sharing this on the air. And you share all about the nuclear, and we said that we're surrounded with them. Yeah. Now, I, the reason I'm saying that is because I don't like to after the fact say, oh yeah. Anybody can get up after it happens and say, you know, I had a dream about that. Yeah. Anybody can. Now, when this started happening with these towers spinning. There were two trees of solid white that were between me and that, those towers. And I asked my daddy, I said, Dad, what's, what's the trees? He said, well, Nebuchadnezzar had a vision of a tree, and it was one year later that it happened. He said it could be two years. It could be two attacks. 
It could be two devastations. It could be related to the two towers that are hit, these two things you saw, that specifically they're going to do the most damage. See, there's no leaves on the trees. They're bleached white. So he said, you'll have to see. Pam is not in the house at that time, and there's a row of homes. They're brick homes. Now, let me say something to you. It's the same exact brick homes I saw in the 9-11 vision when I'm walking up the hill and I see the brick houses on the left and right. Do you all remember that? I told you there were brick houses. Same houses, same exact ones, okay? I say, Pam, you've got to get here quick. And I say to Jonathan, get to the basement. The basement is protection. It's shelter. You've got to find help, find shelter from this. And... I see Pam coming out, and I, I laugh because I don't know how to describe this, but she had a white and black outfit on, and I don't see anyone here that has that design, but I'm going to have to say it, it looked like an outfit that a Chick-fil-A cow skin looks like. <laughs> now, one of these days, I'm going to be able to describe it better than that, but you see the Chick-fil-A, and she had, listen, do you know what just really bothered me? She went out and bought an outfit like that two years ago. This real pretty black and white, just it's got black, not lines, just all kinds of design and white. I said, why'd you buy that? She said, what, you don't like it? I said, no, that's what she was wearing in that crazy vision I had. She said, oh, you want to throw it away? <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden, I saw, in fact, I told you this at a previous partners conference, folks, if you'll remember. I saw bulls that looked just like the bull in front of the stock market, and they were running and, and as fast as they could, and something said the market just collapsed. It went out. And by about that time, after the bulls ran, I saw Pam kind of coming the long way. And I really don't know what this means, to be quite honest with you, but she was coming toward the house, and I was saying, you've got to hurry up and get in the building, Pam. You got to hurt me. I don't know. I don't know if that means Pam will be out of town when this happens. I have no idea. I don't try to read in. Uh, you know, come on, when you have something, you have to read what you know and let the other go because you can't. You'll read too much. Okay. Now, I'm going to. I'm going to tell you what I've been telling people when they say, "What is it?" It's this right here. It's this right here. This may be your two trees. Somewhere there's going to be a war, and there'll be a nuclear facility near water that'll be hit. This was on the coast of water, the one I saw. When it happens, there will be a panic in world markets. And people are going to pull their money out faster than you can blink. Now, let me tell you something about the stock market. I don't play it, but if you're going to be in it, Get companies that are solid and go long term because you don't want to mess when this kind of thing goes up, pulling out, losing money, putting back in when it recovers and all this. Now, I had some partners that listened to the old preacher years ago. When a woman walked in my office and not, can I go on? When a woman walked in my office in 1999 named Emmy. Bob, where are you at? Where's Bob? Everybody look at Bob back there. That's Emmy's husband. Emmy, Emmy went to be with the Lord. Everybody's heard me tell. How many heard me tell the glory to God story? Raise your hands. You heard it. Yeah. How many of you not heard glory to God yet? You not heard Emmy yet? Yeah. Y'all not heard Emmy's story? You got to hear that sometime. 1999. Emmy comes in my office with that big old purse she had. And she said, I got a word for you from God. I said, what is it? She said, you better get you some gold. I said, what? She said, the Holy Ghost told me that down the road you're going to see gold at $1,000 an ounce. It was $225 an ounce at that moment. So I said, get in the car, let's go somewhere. So I just took a break, took her down to a friend of mine. His name is Don Hughes. He's a jeweler, Ray Hughes' son. I said, Don, you know Emmy? Yeah. I said, let, let, let me tell you what God said. He said, well, Don, you better go get you some gold while it's cheap because one of these days it's going to be $1,000 an ounce. And Don just went, because <laughs> Don loves the stock market. He, he's good at the stock market. So when Emmy left, he said, okay, I know she's a praying woman. She's a good woman, but she missed that one. He said, gold ain't never going to be over 350 So you know what I did? 
I went to my wife and I said, you got anything we can cash in? She said, why? I said, I'm going to buy gold. I took a retirement CD and cashed it in. Went right up here in Pigeon Forge to a coin dealer. And I, didn't, I don't have a whole lot, but I cashed it in. Now I paid $230 and today, today, that $230 coin is selling for $1,375. Now, if somebody would have listened to the Holy Ghost, some of you would have doubled, tripled, and quadrupled your investment. Is anybody listening now? I'm not trying to get you to invest. Gold's too high to buy right now. You don't want to go buy it now. It's fluctuating too much. Why do you think everybody on TV is coming on saying, send us your gold jewelry? And do you understand that when the children of Israel came out of Egypt? You don't, want to, you don't want me to go there. I told you in 2010, Pharaoh was rising. I told you that we're in the pattern of Egypt. Now what happened in one of the plagues is the water got polluted and they couldn't drink it and the sea life died, which is the same thing happening off the coast of the Gulf right now. Now, my point is this. I told you that illustration only to make an illustration for you. That in the future, I am say this prophetically, what is going to be important is food and water. When the government right now is going to the dried food places in Oregon and Utah and buying up all number 10 canned dried food and sending people in to buy cases and cartloads of everything they've got and the dried food places says we don't have the ability to keep up with whoever's buying all this. When the government in one state empties out all the military hardware and fills it up with food, what do they know that they're not telling us? Be as independent as possible and as interdependent with other saints as possible. You've got to hear that again. Be as independent in the sense of not having to lean on the government for this and this and this. Be as independent as possible, but be as interdependent on the body of Christ as you can be. Have friends. Make friends. Know people. Get involved in a church. Get involved with people of like precious faith. And trust me when I tell you, because I say it boldly, I, I'm very careful at what I say. You all know that. Why did, why did God give me 78 acres? And after I went to buy it, the guy said, oh, by the way, you see that farm right there? Yeah. You see that big field right there? Yeah. You know what's under that field? No, sir. 300 feet underground between two limestone rocks is one of the best aquifers in Cleveland, Tennessee. He said, that factory right there wanted to buy this property for the water on it. And I wouldn't sell it. I said, what are you saying? He said, it's yours now. He said, oh, by the way, you see that in down there? He said, let's go down and let me show you something. He popped the thing up and turned a hose on, and there was water cold enough to crack your teeth. He said, by the way, you've got another spring running right down there along the road. And he said, on the far end of your property where the old barn is you're going to remodel, you've got another spring. Why did God put three springs on my property? Why did God give me the best water? You ain't hearing what I'm saying, apparently. Why? Why did God give me give me approximately 50 acres of farmable land that can be farmed. It's Omega Ranch Project. You know why? Because when we have a youth camp, we're going to have our own food. Hey, hey, hey. We're going to build chicken coops. We're going to feed kids real eggs. Not stuff that's got all that sterilized mess in it. What's God doing? Listen to me. I'm trying to teach you something, partners. Learn to listen to the Lord. Don't listen to every voice on the news. Don't listen to everybody in the media. Listen to people who are praying and seeking God and listening to the Holy Spirit, whoever they might be, and take heed. Because you've got to understand something. 
God didn't show me the oil thing to scare anybody. He showed me to warn people so that when it happened, they would know that there, it's going to happen, but here's what you do in the middle of it. He doesn't show you about something going to happen like this to say, oh, God, what are we going to do? He says, you know what he says in Isaiah? He says, I will show you things to come because your idol can't show you the future. Your false God can't show you the future. He said, but I'll show it to you so when it comes to pass, you will know that you have a real God that lives in heaven, that knows everything that's going on on earth, and he knows how to take care of those who call upon his name. You better stand up while I shut up. Oh, hallelujah. My, do you feel the anointing of the Lord in this place? Now, I told you every night, every service is different. Every morning service is different. But I'm going to tell you what I feel led we ought to do right now. Woo! And I'm going to ask this question. How many of you in this building, be as honest as you can, that there has been almost a spirit of fear that's tried to really grip your mind the past couple.